it to today's webinar on landscaping with native plants. My name is Lara La Schomer, and I am the Community Outreach Director here at MSHS. I'm online today with Cheryl Kubrith. Kubrith, did I pronounce that right, Cheryl? Uh, second time round was a charm, Kubrith. Kubrith. Oh, Cheryl <laughs> is the founder of Landscape Restoration Inc. and is deeply passionate about restoring and protecting our region's native plant communities. Cheryl is a commercially licensed pesticide applicator, forest pest first detector volunteer, master naturalist volunteer, past president and founding member of the West Metro chapter of Minnesota Master Naturalists, and is currently on the board of directors of the Minnesota Women's Woodland Network. Awesome. Um, so just a few housekeeping tips before we begin. Uh, you are attending the webinar in listen-only mode, so you will be able to hear our presenter, Cheryl, but we can't hear you. If you have any questions for our presenter, you could type those in on the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will cover the questions at the end of the presentation. If you can't see the panel, look for the orange arrow in the upper right-hand corner and just pop that out and you should see the questions in there or the question link. Um, also, you'll find handouts in there that um, Cheryl prepared for us and they are fantastic. So uh, again, welcome Cheryl Colbreth. Take it away, Cheryl. All right, thank you, Laura. And thank you to everybody that is in the audience. I'm gonna give a little disclaimer. Uh, I'm plan B for the Horticultural Society. The intended speaker had uh, something come up and was unavailable, so be gentle with me because, um, as I said, I'm plan B. So the, um, the topic that was slated for the webinar today is landscaping with native plants. And I also wanna, uh, as you can see in the title, throw in the fact that this is about pollinator habitat. And then I snuck in in much smaller letters, AKA invasive plant control, because that's really where my specialty lies is controlling invasives so that our native plants can flourish. So I will move on uh, as soon as I can click on my screen. Oh, whoo, technology is working. Um, I, I told Laura that the part that scared me the most was the technology. It just, uh, I'm, I'm challenged in that way very much. I spend too much time in the woods. So as long as the technology works, I'm good to go. Um, my company is called Landscape Restoration. Um, my uh, trade is a restoration specialist, restoring ecological areas that are native in our region. Um, on the attached handouts, you do have my contact information, my personal information to contact me, as well as the company website. I would ask that if you send me an email that you would put something in the subject line that helps me to realize you're not spam. Uh, you might go there anyway, but if you can say MSHS webinar or Buckthorn question or some such thing, that would help me a lot. So if we're gonna be considering landscaping with native plants, I think it's helpful to understand the importance of native plants. And there are just a couple things I wanna cover. One of the things is, um, there's a symbiotic relationship between plants that have historically occurred in our region and the wildlife that exists alongside of these plants. So we're thinking insects, we're thinking birds, um, we're thinking mammals, et cetera. All of these creatures fit together in that symbiotic relationship. And throughout that process there's a supply of food and shelter etc that allow these species to continue to exist and what happens when we bring in uh, alien or non-native plants is they may offer some benefit i've heard people say well hey i saw you know i saw some uh bumblebees sitting on that xyz plant true uh, but there is no case that i can think of where they offer as significant a benefit as our native plants. And my quick analogy is, um, think of some paper mache fruit, a banana and an orange. The paper mache, it's colored, they look like fruit, they look like an apple, they look like a banana. But if I go to eat them, they're not gonna be very tasty. So unless I'm absolutely starving to death, 
I'm not going to eat them. And if I do, they don't provide much benefit to my system. So that's kind of my analogy. And when we help our ecosystem of native plants uh, with a native wildlife, I think of that as another analogy, which is like an orchestra. Everybody is functioning as a single unit. And when one of those members falls out or has a problem, it messes up the whole system. So here are a couple of references on the screen. And um, I will point out that the date on these is, is some years ago. So the first, uh, first quote from Bill Fielding at the Indiana Department of Transportation, June 2015, almost five years ago, he says, pollinator loss is a national crisis right now. Well, gee, we've lost a lot of time since then, and it doesn't seem like we've quite figured it out completely. So by attending today's webinar and doing things like you're interested in doing, we can make a huge difference if we all pull together and collaborate. And then I think you'd have to be living under a rock worse than me to not hear about pollinator, or excuse me, the monarch numbers being down considerably. And part of that is habitat loss. So what we're gonna talk about today will uh, help all of these creatures. I, um, I wanna start off with what not to do because sometimes when I'm working on something, if I know what not to do, that eliminates a lot of possibilities for me. So what not to do, here is an example of a yard that is in North St. Paul. And if you look at the blue siding, uh, the trellis, the window, there's a, a, a lovely buckthorn shrub that's actually being trellised and cared for as if it were something valuable. And then on the um, right side of the screen, on a, a berm in the front yard by the street is a, a huge invasive uh, honeysuckle shrub. And um, we complete the trifecta of what not to do. Along the driveway, we've got several Japanese barberry plants. They are, um, uh, and in combination, so, so much could be done differently here to create a high value native landscape that would have much, much benefit to our pollinators, birds, et cetera. So moving on, here we have another, um, it looks all right. This is a yard in Minnetonka. What we've got in the background are the tall, very dense uh, stand of buckthorn. And the yellow flowers in front are non-native tansy, very invasive, especially in Northern Minnesota. And then in the front, we fill out with some sedum. Um, I think sedum's okay, but probably uh, it could use some other things to go along with it. And then if I look way to the right-hand side, we've got some non-native grass like Carl Forster grass. So, okay, um, I just think we could do much better than this, especially taking out some of the invasives. This uh, is another yard in Minnetonka, lovely um, inset showing the leaves of this plant. The problem is this plant is Japanese barberry. This infestation is huge. I've watched it grow over the years. Uh, I used to work for the city of Minnetonka as a restoration specialist in their natural resources department. And I have been watching this for many years, it's private property. So I am not allowed to uh, do anything about it, nor was I in a position to talk to the landowner. But uh, this is on, I believe it's on the eradicate list, if not uh, the prohibited list um, with the uh, noxious weed law with the Department of Ag. So if they decide at some point to get rid of this, that would be terrific, but it will be a long battle. In the meantime, the seeds from um, these, uh, Flowers that will bloom are eaten by birds, uh, carried, uh, you know, by who's ever mowing the lawn or if somebody walks by, they're blown in the street. We're going to carry this stuff all over. And the thing to know about this plant that's really scary is that if you were to uh, cut it and do a stem treatment, like maybe you've done on Buckthorn or heard about, you are going to have to be very careful where you dispose of those cut stems because they will reroot. So we really um, have a problem with this plant. And I'm gonna move off this bad news subject, uh, I, I think after this slide or the, the next slide. But I wanted to also make folks in the audience aware that you can get onto uh, an e-distribution through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and you will receive a whole bunch of different information 
like the one that I'm showing. This is their current, this is April, 2020, the weed of the month, the Siberian pea shrub, another pain uh, that is uh, difficult to get rid of. Sometimes they'll list some of the insects that are a problem, but it's really interesting to, to be aware of some of these items because when you know better, you have the opportunity to do better. And also on your attached handouts, there is a link that I've put into the Minnesota Department of Agriculture website, which is the noxious weed list. It's the state uh, weed law, uh, noxious weed law. I told Laura earlier that um, I wanted to get some connection information to their site. And so I looked up weed law and you wouldn't believe how many cannabis articles showed up. So uh, make sure you're using noxious weed law or something like that. Okay, moving on. Um, so one of the critical components of landscaping with native plants is to be aware of controlling invasive plants. These are some pretty heavy duty infestations of things that we have throughout Minnesota, especially uh, around the metro area and into Southern Minnesota where I live. There's a big buckthorn infestation in a park in Minnetonka on the left. And then garlic mustard has completely taken over a natural area in the photo on the right. Uh, garlic mustard is one of those plants that's called allelopathic, meaning that uh, it quickly forms a monoculture. It actually changes the composition of the soil in such a way that it renders it uh, undesirable to our native plants. So this is one that scares me a lot because uh, if we don't keep things like this under control, in our future generations, we may not have such things as trees. And that would be a very bad thing if the planet can even exist without trees. These uh, couple of photos I'm just gonna throw in just because the one on the left um, is an invasive, it's called Dame's Rocket. I can't think of the Latin right now, but this is one and it just happened about a week ago. I was in someone's yard doing um, a consultation in their woodland. I said, by the way, you have blah, 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 blah. You have Dame's Rocket. And she said, oh, she goes, uh, well, I thought that was a good plant. So I stopped there. When I went home, I had to send some follow-up information and I sent her a link to uh, read about Dame's Rocket. Well, when she read that, she was shocked at what a horrible plant this is for the environment, but yet perhaps as gardeners, we've been sharing things like that. And the photo on the right is Dianthus. Um, I know that in my yard, when I lived in Minnetonka, I had planted this. What's unfortunate is that it has turned up in uh, my 40 acre woodland and it's going, um, it's going nuts. And so I'm having to pull it, I'm having to deadhead it. Who would have ever thought I would have never thought in my wildest dreams that Dianthus was gonna start a woodland invasion. So these are just things to be aware of. And the plant sharing, and I, and I think now this is the last bad slide. I bring this up because years ago before I knew better, my sister said to me, oh, I have this really pretty purple flowering plant in my yard, would you like some? Well, sure. So she gave me some European bellflower and unbeknownst to both of us at the time, this was a really bad move for first for her to have it and second for me to accept it because I didn't know any better. It's an invasive alien that, um, uh, and this will be true of all of the invasive plants to some extent, but in this case, this, the root system on this plant, I kept trying to dig it out. Well, if I didn't get every single iota of this root system, it continued to grow back. At some point, I just had to take some herbicide and daub it on, on the stem so that it would kill the root structure. Very, very invasive plant. So it has long-term viability. Uh, major seed producer or the root system makes it very viable. It can spread rapidly and degrade natural areas. Not all alien plants do this, but a good enough number of them do that we might want to think twice about even planting them at all, or if you must, maybe stick them in a pot on your front porch. The other big problem with why these plants are so uh, devastating and invasive is because they're not native to our ecosystem and therefore they lack natural enemies that would keep them in check as they are kept in check in their own ecosystem. This one's probably from Siberia or Europe or Asia somewhere. Um, and in their own environment, they will have insects that eat them, uh, 
plants, uh, or excuse me, animals and wildlife that might eat them. There might be beetles that eat the buds or things that attack the root structure. And all of these natural predators keep these plants in check. But when they come into an uh, ecosystem where they're not native, none of those protections exist. And as I mentioned, these are characteristics that are common to, to many of our alien plants. And again, just to restate in your attached handouts, there is a link, as I mentioned, to the Department of Agriculture, but also the Minnesota DNR has an awesome link. And you can click on different plants and it'll show you the picture. It'll help you with uh, what to do for control, how to identify, why they're bad, et cetera, et cetera. So now we're moving on to something more fun, which is native plants for your climate and your site conditions. Uh, we could also say, why are there no palm trees in Minnesota? Well, it's because the conditions here are not appropriate for palm trees. And so you'll have the most success in landscaping with native plants if you choose those plants which are best suited to the conditions you have. One of the first things to look at is the soil type. Um, you can go from the extreme of very dry, sandy soil to the other end of the spectrum, which is heavy clay soil and emerging wetland edges. If I take a plant that desires something in sandy soil, dry soil, and I try to put it in my heavy clay soil here in Rice County, it may not be so very successful. So take a look at what are your soil conditions. The other thing is sun exposure. Some plants uh, are gonna require full sun, some will require full shade, and a lot of them are gonna be somewhere in the spectrum. So knowing what the plant that you're interested in or knowing what your site has will then help you choose the plant that's appropriate. And another thing is keeping in mind that uh, our growing season here in Minnesota is short. So finding staggered bloom times is gonna help uh, your aesthetic enjoyment of your yard. It's gonna also help uh, pollinators that show up at various times throughout the year. And then of course, there's this thing that's called winter interest because winter lasts so long here. It's nice to have things that maybe have uh, like a red osier dogwood um, in front of uh, some sort of cedar tree or pine tree, um, di different things like that. The other thing to consider is size. How much room do you have? Some plants, even though they're native, they can be quite aggressive. And some of the goldenrod species are a great example of that. Goldenrod is a native plant. It does support pollinator habitat. It does support birds and other wildlife. However, it can come to the point where it almost creates a monoculture uh, crowding out other species. And so just being mindful of that, how much space do you have? Maybe are you willing to do a little bit of control to keep that plant in check so that it can coexist with the other plants? Also height uh, is another um, item to keep in mind so that your design is aesthetically pleasing and that these plants can all work well together. And of course, be sure to check your, oh, I just see I have a typo there, a UDSA zone should really be a USDA zone, um, especially as our climate is changing, we might be moving into a little bit higher zone than we were 20 years ago. And then it comes to gardener's choice. After you've considered all of the above, then start to look more closely at the colors you like and the textures you like. And if you're like I was years ago before I understood about the importance of native plants, I would see a picture of something or I'd see it in somebody's yard and I would say, oh, that's so pretty. I want that in my yard. But I know better now and I'd rather get the right plant for the right place for the right reason. I'm gonna just do a little tutorial here on natives and native ours. Native ours is a big thing that's coming out now and wildflowers, they're not all the same. So a native plant would be something that has historically occurred in the place it's growing. It's naturally there. Uh, no one planted it, it's just the way that nature's design has placed it. It is unaltered by humans. There's no genetic modification to create something different than it is. Once they are established, native plants are also very low maintenance. Again, once they're established and if they're in the suitable habitat. Those initial first years might require some weeding. There might be some other weird stuff coming in there, 
but by and large, one of the things I like about them is that they're low maintenance. Native ours. So here's what's going on with native ours is we take one of those native plants that we just talked about, and then uh, a breeder will say, oh, gee, I find this, this, uh, the characteristics of this XYZ plant to be quite desirable, and I'd like to cross these two plants. And there we come up with things like Sun King, the 2020 perennial of the year. That is a real deal because I looked it up. I was part of a neighborhood garden club years ago where we were uh, solely responsible for propagating uh, a hideous number of invasive plants throughout the neighborhood. And um, I would not have thought anything of taking the perennial of the year and putting it in. In fact, this is just a little diss to those of you that are master gardeners. I'm a master naturalist. and and don't take this seriously because I'm kind of having some fun with it, but we say, oh, you're a master, you're a master gardener. Oh, you're, you're the ones that put in the perennial of the year so that us master naturalists can come and dig them out and uh, do control measures five, 10 years later. So just had to throw that inappropriate remark in there. Okay, so what's wrong with native ours? Well, there's a couple things that I would say personally, I find undesirable about them. And there is, um, the possibility of pollinator benefits being lost. Because the plant that the native has been crossed with, the cultivar, is probably not local origin. If it were, we wouldn't need to cross it. Something like that would already exist. So if we take a plant that's not from here and we cross it with a native plant, it can have a negative impact on our pollinators. It's quite confusing to them. Um, sometimes there are known cases where a pollinator will lay eggs on a species that resembles what they think is the native plant that they're used to using as their host plant. But in actuality, uh, it's not going to be able to sustain those eggs. Those eggs will die and we're hurting that population of pollinators for that species. Sometimes these plants are sterile and therefore there will be no seeds or um, fruit as a benefit to wildlife. Here's a personal one for me, they may go rogue. I had a little blue stem that I planted, a little blue stem species that I planted in my front yard. I don't know if it was the blues, but it was something, a native are. Thankfully, I planted it in a place, in a place that was isolated on four sides by concrete, a driveway, concrete, et cetera because it became very invasive. If any of you have planted a little blue stem, you know that it's not invasive. But this thing started growing faster than my lawn. And eventually I had to result to digging it out and a little bit of uh, herbicide to kill it. So that pretty much sealed the fate of native ours in my yard or on my plants for landscaping. Oh, sorry, my bad. Now here's another one, wildflowers. Many times wildflowers are not native. That term is thrown about loosely. And there are things that are wildflowers, such as I just gave a few examples. There are many, many more. Orange ditch lilies, Queen Anne's lace, tansy. Those are examples of wildflowers or plants that were placed in the garden by well-meaning gardeners. And then they escape cultivation and suddenly they're appearing in all kinds of natural areas, ditches. Our ditches out here in Rice County are full of Queen Anne's lace and its companion plant, uh, wild parsnip. Um, so we, we want to be very careful about what plants we're putting in. If you're going to take the time to nurture and care for your landscape, then choose wisely and think about the big impact uh, down the road. And then the asterisk up at the very top native plants, well, native to where? Something could be native in Indiana, but if I planted in my Minnesota yard, my pollinators are not on the same schedule as the pollinators in, in Indiana. So maybe that plant is gonna bloom two weeks before my pollinators show up in mass. And when they get here, they are not gonna find what they need. So therefore the term local origin is important. We want native plants that are local origin, meaning within our region. There are some native plants that exist only in a tiny area. 
Up at the top right hand, I've inserted a picture of a dwarf trout lily. The dwarf trout lily is on the federally endangered species list. And amazingly, that tiny little plant, its flower bud is the size of a piece of white rice. That uh, small, beautiful plant grows natively uh, or endemically in three counties in Minnesota. I believe it's Rice County, Steel County, maybe Good Earth, along the Cannon and Strait River. Those are the only naturally occurring populations on the planet Earth. So sometimes people will go into the wild and say, oh, hey, here's some of those dwarf trout lilies. Let's dig them up and put them in our yard, in our landscape, and that would be really cool. Well, the problem is you just killed that plant because it's probably not gonna grow in your yard. There's a reason it only grows in a certain area, and that's because it's got special requirements that likely don't exist, exist in your yard. So I would encourage you to not do that. We've seen it happen, it's very sad, and it leads to us not telling people where special plants are because we have found that people tend to go and dig them up and all they do is die. Another example um, is black locust is native in the Ozarks, Appalachians area. Uh, so people say, well, it's native in the United States. It is not native in the Midwest. If you've ever dealt with black locust, you will quickly learn that it is a bad idea to plant that uh, tree. It's very difficult to control. It's very invasive. And if you cut it, the bigger it is, uh, if it's a pretty good sized black locust tree, you're gonna have thousands of sprouts coming up. So special control measures are required to get rid of that effectively. All right, moving on. Here's an example of what can happen when you landscape for wildlife and when you're controlling or working at control of your invasives like garlic mustard and buckthorn. Um, this is a native plant, hoary leaf skull cap. It is on my property. It appeared in my woodland. I had never in my life seen it before. It took me months to ID this plant. Well, maybe not that long, but it felt like years. I couldn't find it. It's not, it wasn't in the plant books that I had, but I kept looking. Finally, I found reference to it. And then I realized the reason I hadn't been able to find it is because it hasn't been found in my county since 1989. And in fact, in the entire state of Minnesota, only seven mapped locations exist. Well, mine's not mapped, but I now have an eighth known population. And it was just because of some buckthorn control taking out some of that bad stuff and letting just enough light in that this seed was in the seed bank. This naturally occurred here. And what an awesome reward for me doing some buckthorn work. So this is the good thing of what can happen. There's a lot of bad stuff in the seed bank, but there are also some fabulous surprises and rewards that exist there. That inset photo is a, a little close up of the leaves. And so it kind of explains why they call it uh, ovata, ovate leaves. And also being in this woodland area, the picture reminds me, one of the things that I do when I go on my nature walks on my property is if I know a plant to be native um, in the fall, winter, I'll kind of tug along the seed heads and scatter them as I go on a walk and I'm helping to propagate the uh, native uh, plants as I do that. This is a picture though, not in all its glory, this is a picture in my yard and the reason I planted this stuff here is because we have a peat moss septic system in this area. And I didn't wanna be mowing over it and blah, 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 blah. Um, so it grew really well, really fast, much faster than I thought. And I've been having to take things out of here. Um, but one of the things that I did that is, I would consider a mistake or that's something I would do differently in the future is, it's in the middle of that lawn area. It's pretty close to adjacent wildlife areas. But what I learned when I read Douglas Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, which I'll talk about later, I think it's a must read for anybody that does anything with plants outside. Um, one of the things that Douglas Tallamy suggests is rather than planting a circle in the middle of our yard, we can have a much bigger impact on pollinators and other wildlife if we plant uh, adjoining other plant areas. So for example, if you're living in a suburban area, 
if you plant your native plants along your fence line to your neighbors, and now your neighbors are also doing the same thing, you have just made a bigger contiguous area of native plants. And many of our species require significant contiguous areas to exist and flourish. So versus doing my, you know, this is a pretty good size area, but versus digging up an eight foot circle in the middle of your yard, consider making that along your border with your neighbors and creating a much bigger area. All right, here are some of the things that I find to be pretty attractive about using native plants. There is a little green tree frog sitting on my uh, American hazelnut, native shrub, um, fruit for deer, etc. cetera. And um, not to say this won't grow on an, uh, an alien shrub or live on an alien shrub, but they're much more content where they belong. And as you learn to landscape with native plants, one of the things that's tougher to get used to is that native plants are going to be eaten by native insects. And so you will see leaf damage. You will see that critters have been nibbling on it. And instead of saying, oh, that's terrible, uh, realize that you're having a positive impact on nature by having these native plants versus the cultivars that are, um, resistant to insects, resistant to this, resistant to that. Well, if they're resistant to everything, they really aren't having a lot of benefit to our natural world. There's the bumblebee on uh, Leatris, Leatris, I always say Leatris. So definitely it's uh, doing its job as a pollinator. Here's uh, the shell of a, a milkweed pod. All of those hairy fibers that you see are uh, useful to many birds for nesting material. So, and of course, we know that the monarch plant is a host plant for milkweed. Monarchs have to lay their eggs on milkweed plants. Um, in fact, I did some research and I found out that there are, uh, according to one study, at least 147 species of animals and insects that utilize milkweed at some point. So it's not just monarchs, there are many other species that will use that. So there's a benefit of having that native plant. And of course, berries. If we use our uh, native shrubs, the berries are not gonna be problematic when the birds eat them and you know do a flyover and deposit some of those seeds here and there versus eating things like berries from buckthorn or invasive honeysuckle, that's gonna cause a bigger problem. So here we are feeding appropriately uh, things to wildlife. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick little commercial break here just to say these are some of the products that my company provides. Um, I told Laura that considering the times we're going through right now, it's pretty rough on everybody. I'm dedicating my time um, to the historical, or excuse me, the historical, the horticultural society today. So I said, I'd like to just at least do a plug. If any of you are doing buckthorn work or you're trying to eradicate some plants, we sell the buckthorn blaster, not just for buckthorn. Um, it's got a foam applicator tip. So when you place your own herbicide in there, that foam applicator tip, it, it doesn't uh, uh, target anything that's not to be targeted. So there's no spray over spray. It's a very fine area that's treated directly. And then we also sell the replacement components, caps, additional foam tips, and market blue dye, a water soluble uh, dye indicator dye, which you can see to the bottom right of the screen. I've given a couple of examples of how we use um, these uh, products to treat uh, undesirable plants. So in the picture at the rightmost corner, we're illustrating that's an actual buckthorn stump. We only need to treat that outer perimeter to reach the cambium area. Uh, to the immediate left of that, you'll see a bigger stump with the shiny round thing in the middle. That's actually a quarter. So that was a buckthorn on my property, went around the edge. Of course, this thing was enormous and it was uh, dead after that. We never saw it again, no sprouts gone. The other thing that I like that we offer is our buckthorn uh, field ID guide. It's got a number of our native shrub species that you will find in the same areas where buckthorn grows. It's a great way to ID. We show every stage of identification with color photos of the plants, uh, leaves, uh, buds for winter ID, flowers, and the fruit. 
So that's enough for that. Um, the wrong button again. And then, you know, here's something I've heard is like, oh gosh, I've seen native landscapes. You know, they're really, they're really not very pretty. And I, I think beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. As you start to look at these native plants, they're absolutely, utterly gorgeous. Blue flag iris, uh, trillium, butterfly milkweed. Uh, this is one of my favorite woodland ground covers that just popped up. Um, Virginia waterleaf, great ground cover, tolerates a lot of shade, beautiful little flower. Shooting star, bloodroot, my favorite spring ephemeral. Uh, showy orchis grows in my woodland. Wild blue violets, gorgeous. And there is um, an unopened swamp milkweed or rose milkweed, Sclepius incarnata, going to be gorgeous. There's a flower from uh, marsh marigold. And the berries that just popped up are a brilliant blue from uh, blue cohosh. And uh, there's a, and for moisture, wetter areas, cardinal flower and blue lobelia, Michigan lily. And that flower belongs to the service berry. I showed the berry a little bit earlier in one of the slides. Uh, they're very tasty. If you can uh, share them with the birds, they'll probably get there first, but beautiful flower. And of course, not that it grows in our area natively, but our state's flower. So I think that we've, and this is just, just the tip of the iceberg of what we have to offer for native landscaping plants. One of the things that I have uh, found to be very helpful to me, and I cannot, I told Laura, I cannot find the right words to tell people how valuable Douglas Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, is for anyone that's interested in helping nature and doing native landscaping. The information he provides is so basic and so simple. Just like the story of, hey, if you're gonna put some native plants in your yard or do a garden, don't stick it in the circle in the middle. Try to connect up with your neighbor's parcel so that you'll have that larger area. He goes through many, many plants and talks about how they benefit nature. A lot of people will say, well, what's the best plant to plant? Well. Again, that depends. Of course, you have to have the right site. But for example, in the research that uh, Douglas Tallamy was able to put together, there is a page in his book where he shows woody plants, shrubs, trees, ranked by how many species of Lepidoptera they support. So Lepidoptera would be butterflies, moths. The oak tree, king of the forest, the oak tree supports, according to his book, and this is just in Lepidoptera species, 534 species, followed by the willow. Cherry, we have native cherry plants uh, are um, a great choice here. They are aesthetically pleasing. They provide uh, habitat and, uh, and housing and food for the birds. Uh, cherries and plums are supporting 456 species of Lepidoptera alone. And on and on and on the list goes. So if you... Um, have some time on your hands, which a lot of us do because of what's going on in the world right now, I would definitely encourage you to buy that book and um, then pass it on to somebody else and share it. Douglas Tallamy just recently came out with a brand new book called Nature's Best Hope. They're flying off the shelves in the bookstores. I can't keep them in stock. So um, these are available at our website. You can order them online, but I would encourage you to consider that if you've got some time to read. So. Sticking with that COVID-19 theme, there's always a silver lining I find. And so we've got some time to do things maybe we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So here are my ideas for you. Learn more about native plants that are appropriate for your landscaping and that appeal to you. Especially learn how to identify and control invasive plants in your landscaping. And I am willing for people to uh, email me photos of plants if you want some help and identification. Just make sure that they're good quality pictures. I cannot tell when something's fuzzy and there's a bunch of stuff mixed in the background. So I'm happy to help you with that if I can. And of course, what a great time now before it gets too, too warm and leaves start to come out in a major way. Work on eradicating buckthorn in your yard and other undesirables. You can buy those books from our website from Douglas Tallamy. And especially get out and enjoy nature and the rewards of restoring native habitat. You will find 
um, that plants will appear out of nowhere that are beautiful native plants that you had no idea were there. Maybe it's a bird that you see that you haven't seen for a long time. Uh, so many things can happen when we're out in nature. It's just darn good for us. And let's also think about what can we do to leave some sort of a legacy for future generations. We hear so much about what's wrong in the world. We've got climate change conversations. We've got global warming. And there's so much we can do so easily by just collaborating with each other and making a few choices a little bit differently than we would have in the past. And speaking of a living legacy, there's a picture of my um, female uh, relatives. So this is uh, this picture is taken by the, a DNR photographer. It was a, a, for stories about legacy, land legacies. My dad in 1970 started working with the DNR in this 40 acre plot uh, to improve uh, habitat for wildlife. And uh, he's been gone now for nearly 30 years, but this is a small portion of his, his uh, uh, follow on generation. This is only, 13 of 36 female descendants. And that would be my 93 year old mother there in the middle, still going like crazy. So I'm gonna wrap things up here. Uh, COVID-19 to-do list, one last thing, hug a tree. It looks like a lot of fun. And so with that, I'm gonna open this up to Lara and uh, we'll see if anybody has any questions. I'm I'm a minute or two early, but um, that means we have time for lots of questions. Yeah, well, wow. Thank you so much, Cheryl, so much. Fantastic and important information. Um, and I definitely share your love of Douglas Tallamy. He really <laughs> presents information well. Um, right, yeah. right yeah. on. He's, 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 he's at the top of my list. Yep, <laughs> mine too. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, um, Kind of a big question. Um, Jack asks, um, he has a lot of shade in his yard. Which natives should he use? Okay. I, I am, I'm gonna put a big plug in here for Prairie Moon Nursery because they were supposed to be the presenter today and, and you got me instead. Um, and I do have a link to Prairie Moon in the handouts that are attached. I have their website and a phone number. I would say, uh, if you go to their website, you will be able to look for plants that meet your criteria. So plants that thrive in shade, and they're going to bring those up and you can kind of look through them and that will help you make some choices because there's going to be a, a, a spectrum of shade. Uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite woodland plants in my shady woodland, <laughs> that's why it's shady because it's a woodland, is the Virginia water leaf. Great ground cover. Um, so I'd say that's probably one of my top favorites. Uh, the, uh, I also love some of the wild violets. I showed a picture of the blue wild violet. They do not take over a woodland area. I know some people say, oh, they just go all over. Well, in the woodland, that's not how they respond. So that's another one that I like. Uh, certainly there are some spring ephemerals that'll do wonderfully. Uh, so I would suggest that you go to the Prairie Moon website and if you're not finding what you need or you want more information, their staff is incredibly helpful if you have questions about anything to do with any of their plants. I um, almost purchased exclusively from Prairie Moon for any plants that I don't already have naturally occurring. Um, so there's my answer. Hopefully that will help you. Yeah, they are wonderful at Prairie Moon down there in Winona. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see here. We have lots of questions. Um, this next one is, do you have or do you recommend an app for IDing plants? You know, I, I don't have an app that I personally would recommend. Um, I've heard people talk about iNaturalist, but I've heard people say, well, yeah, they're helpful and they're not helpful. And um, what I like to do is is, well, two things. I like to try to figure it out myself. And one of the ways is by looking at a dichotomous key. Sometimes that can get really confusing and the results are very mixed, believe me. I've been very frustrated with that. Sometimes I just resort to, uh, again, in the handouts, I list towards the bottom um, a few uh, books that I would recommend that are helpful with plant ID. Uh, one of them for trees is Welby Smith from the Minnesota DNR, but right above that, 
um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but it, it will it will help you in that, especially if there's uh, it's flowering, um, you can go in and look at the, the color and it'll sort of lead you to what that plant might be. Sometimes I find it more enjoyable to thumb through that than to fight with the dichotomous key. I do both, but they both have their advantages. And the other thing that I like about that publication is it will tell you, it will show you on the map, what region that plant, where it is native. So if it's obviously something that only occurs in Florida, you know that that's probably not what you're finding in your area. Um, the other thing it tells you is whether or not it's invasive. There are some popular wildflower books out there that uh, are showing things and talking about them, but they fail to mention that they're extremely degrading to native habitats. So that's one of the reasons I like that. Lots of species in there, uh, really well designed for our area, and um, one of my favorite resources. Great. Um, let's see here. Do you have a favorite plant or something you could recommend for small spaces? Wow. Okay. This recommending of plants, we could be getting down a slippery slope here. I hate to even say because what what I like may not grow in your area. Uh, I did mention that one of my favorite spring ephemerals is bloodroot. And I think that that's a pretty forgiving plant. I don't know about sandy soils. I have a lot of... Um, I have a lot of clay in my area, very, very organic, moist soil here. So probably if I had to choose one plant that's my favorite, it would be the bloodroot uh, spring ephemeral. Mm. But you know, beyond that, I, I think there again, prairie moon would be a great place to start mm -hmm. and look and see what plants they offer that are suitable to the conditions of your site. And then maybe talk to one of their staff members and, um, and see what they have to say. Because without me being at the site, it's hard to say. One of the ways sometimes I can tell, or we all can tell, what plants will do well there is to look at what's currently growing that's native. Uh, nature has a way of knowing what it needs. And so if you're in the maple, uh, basswood, oak forest, well, there are species that lend themselves to that. And the Minnesota DNR has publications that are specific to various regions of the state of Minnesota that will tell you what indicator species exist. And then from that, they can tell you what other things are appropriately going to grow there. So that might also be a way to find out what will grow well in your area. Hmm, great. Um, a question about buckthorn. When is the best time to use buckthorn blaster to get rid of buckthorn? I have usually tried to do it after Labor Day, but what about results earlier in the year? Well, now you're getting into my specialty. <laughs> I'm sitting up straight now. Uh, okay, here's here's the take on buckthorn. Um, I would like to say I recommend doing buckthorn from roughly mid-July throughout the fall, throughout the winter, and then stopping around this time of year, maybe mid-April, when the plant begins to leaf out. And here's the reason why we want to stop shortly. When the plant is starting to leaf out, it is taking stored energy from the root structure and sending it upward for plant growth, leaf development, et cetera. So if from roughly the end of April and May, uh, we're putting herbicide on that cut stem, we may have success, we may have some success, we may have no success because as the flow of energy is going upward, it's not helping our cause. We wanna wait till the plant is fully leafed out or dormant in winter when energy is being stored in the root system. So it's sucking itself down into the root structure. The One of the indicators as well is when you cut the buckthorn, if you're getting too late into the season, one of the indicators that you'll find is after you cut it, you'll notice it starts to get kind of moist where you cut that little bit of you know, wet seepage. That's telling me that the sap is flowing upward and you probably ought to let it go. However, uh, one of the things that I have employed when it is not a good time to use herbicides, I'll cut my buckthorn, especially I'm after berry producers, I wanna stop the production of more seed. I may cut that trunk about three feet above the ground. So now I can 
I can stack my brush along the slope, perpendicular to the slope. I can uh, prevent another crop of berries from developing. But I have this three foot stem. When the regrowth that occurs, it'll be up high. So there is still plenty of room where I can come in and make a second cut later in the year in fall, for example, and, and uh, treat the um, stump at that time and then just take that leftover log and put it right on the brush pile uh, somewhere around that, that stump. I like to leave my brush around the base of the plant, of that buckthorn, because it's shading out the, the, the woodland floor where all those berries have been dropping. I am not a proponent of hauling the buckthorn <clears throat> berries and brush out of the woods. We need that um, material on the forest floor to cover up the bare spots and those berries will fall to the ground. They'll get covered by other branches and leaf litter and germination will be much, much less so than if you hauled everything out and left that bare area for the sun to hit and encourage germination. So hopefully that answers the question. Hmm, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, let's see here. Do you have any recommendations for native grass to use instead of traditional lawn? We are building a new home and have a blank slate. Ooh, I do have a couple suggestions. And um, I've done this myself in my, my yard. Again, back to the prairie moon folks in Winona, they have something called eco grass. And eco grass is uh, low maintenance grass. Um, I planted it in an area, and by the way, I'm gonna expand the area where I'm planting it, but I have a, a pretty big part of my yard um, where I've got pine trees growing and I didn't wanna have bare soil. I want, originally it started with some lawn, then the trees came in. And it was really a bugger to try to get my lawnmower around all that stuff. And so uh, we planted um, the eco grass from Prairie Moon in that area and extended it into other areas. And I just let it go. I don't have to mow it. If I feel like mowing it, I can. It's very durable to foot traffic, very, uh, very lovely to look at. And so um, that would be one that I would encourage if you're looking to fill in a yard. It's also very tolerant of natives. It won't choke out the native plants that I have growing. It'll just kind of yield to them being there. It takes a little bit to establish it because there's probably a pretty decent weed base. And so, you know, you're going to just need to realize uh, you should have good site prep before you put it in. And then um, talk to the folks at Prairie Moon about what that would look like. And uh, what to be aware of when you're establishing that um, that yard. Uh, the other ones that I like, of course, uh, prairie drop seed is a beautiful landscape specimen. I don't know that you'd want it in your whole yard, but it certainly is a beautiful clumping grass. Uh, it's probably no more than about two and a half feet tall. Really like that one, beautiful seed heads. Uh, there are three that are my favorites. It would be that one, um, well, maybe four. Side Oats Grandma, I also like that. Native, Kabutalua Curtipendula, I'm sure you all remember that. Um, and then of course, Little Blue Stem and Big Blue Stem. Those would be my top four choices for, for grasses. Um, they typically are gonna want some sun. And uh, I'd say out of all of those, Big Blue Stem is probably the most tolerant of mixed conditions. Great. Are you okay with a couple of more questions, Cheryl? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang in here until you shut my mic off. Okay. <laughs> All right. Is there a native plant that's a good competitor for cut leaf coneflower? I have it planted near our pond lake, but it has a tendency to take over. I've been pulling it, but if there's a good competitor to keep it in check, I'd rather that. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to give you, besides the obvious prairie moon, because they'll have... Um, wetland plants that I would like you to take a look at and see what might fit your site. I would also suggest that when you're dealing around wetlands, go to bluethumb.org and they have uh, great information when you're working around wet areas and wetlands. Uh, personally, I love my blue flag iris at the edge of my wetland. I love cardinal flower. I've got some ironweed. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, uh, my swamp milkweed grows there. It's not as uh, robustly spreading as common milkweed, uh, but it's just beautiful. So as I'm just thinking off the top of my head, those are some of the plants that I have around my wetland edge. Uh, marsh marigold, they're a little bit trickier to get 
going, but once they take off, they just don't spread a ton. And then if you're looking for something shrubby, always the dogwoods, uh, such as the red osier dogwood, gray dogwood are, are nice at the edge of a wetland. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. Those are some of the things that I like. And then your resources would be bluethumb.org and Prairie Moon Nursery. Mm -hmm. Blue Thumb is a great resource, I agree. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. Um, this is from Rachel. I love the Virginia water leaf when I first moved in, but it has turned terribly invasive. Any ideas on how to best control it? <laughs> I get some shade. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, wow, you know, I, I guess I've never had anybody have a problem with Virginia water leaf. Um, mostly because it's going to grow in a woods and the shade is just going to do some to keep it in check. So it might be getting too much sun. <clears throat> um, I, I hesitate to say control it with herbicides. That might be one way. I guess before I did that, I would talk to the folks at Blue Thumb or not Blue Thumb. I would talk to the folks at Prairie Moon and um, uh, somebody that maybe has uh, some expertise I was going to say in shady woodlands, but I don't think you have a real shady woodland because it wouldn't be invasive. You might have a native R, <laughs> those darn native R's. But I, I, I haven't had experience with the problem with that plant. So maybe talking to somebody at Prairie Moon uh, would be beneficial. Or, yeah, boy, I don't know. That's a tough one. I don't have a real good answer. Hmm, okay. Um, on the herbicide note, someone asked, what did you use in, which herbicide did you use um, to control your European bellflower? I used glyphosate. So again, I had a buckthorn blaster so that that tip at the top, that foam tip is about a half inches in diameter. So I didn't want to be spraying anything. And I just cut the stem um, at the soil, just slightly above the soil so I wouldn't be daubing in dirt. And then I just daubed the tip of that um, buckthorn blaster with glyphosate at about an 18% strength. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that, that was the ticket. So, I mean, it wasn't even a drop of herbicide. It was less than a drop and that worked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have been in situations like for the city of Minnetonka where we were in high value native areas and we have done spot spraying of the rosettes so they'll just be small rosettes kind of like garlic mustard rosettes in this time of the year and that's another option if you want to spot spray with a low dose of glyphosate probably you know you have to check the label always because every manufacturer has different instructions for their herbicide but typically we look around at a two percent strength of glyphosate to spot spray the rosettes in early spring or late fall for control Hmm. All right. Um, we have a question about big root geranium. How do you feel about it? I have some Roundup that I'm trying to use sparingly. I spray the spray the tip of their cutoff stems, and then I cover up that plant. How long until it is safe to uncover the Roundup sprayed tip? I don't want the birds or insects to be harmed. Okay, I don't know what big root geranium is. Maybe I know it by a different name. Mm -hmm. um, but I, so I don't know that plant, but um, again, I would do the same thing with that plant. At least this would be my first attempt is what I did with that European bellflower. I would uh, cut the stem near the, near the grade, near the soil, and I would just treat that stem. At that point, I wouldn't cover it. I would just let it be. Uh, there are no, glyphosate, for example, does not contain neonicotinoids. So there's no harm to pollinators. I have yet to see any pollinator land on something that I treated with glyphosate. Because again, it's such a small area. Um, there's nothing to attract a pollinator to that because, well, especially buckthorn, those non-native plants are not attractive to pollinators. Um, so in my experience, I haven't seen any harm and just leaving that exposed. The stem can't be that big. I mean, I don't know, what are we talking, like maybe an inch in diameter? So um, that's my thought, but again, I'm not really familiar with that plant. I don't know the biology of that plant. So I would probably have to do some research on that one if I had it in my yard. All right. 
Got a few people really just loving all the information and saying thank you so much for donating your time and for bringing these beautiful flowers into our world right now. That's so oh, cool. My yeah. pleasure. I, yeah. you know, my motto is if people will listen, I will talk. I just, <laughs> the, the thing that's so hard for me is I have so much information about so many different topics and what can be done in 45 minutes is kind of the tip of the iceberg just to give you some new ways perhaps of thinking or some things to consider that hadn't occurred to folks before um, but there's you know it's the tip of the iceberg yeah good place to get started and again those resources and the handouts um, on the so if you don't see the handouts they're on the right side of the screen in the um, box that pops out with the orange arrow all the way toward the bottom you'll see a little gray tab that says handouts that if you press on the little um, arrow, it will pull down the two handouts and you should be able to download those. But um, yeah, Cheryl put together some really nice resources. Um, one that has is about the buckthorn, correct, Cheryl? Right. And the other yep. about pollinators and places you can go to get more information. Yep, lots of reading material. And again, I don't mind if folks want to email me, I would be happy to take your emails. Just remember to put something in the subject line that tells me you're legitimate and you're not a, a spammer. Um, and then be patient with me. This is kind of a busy time of year right now. Um, I'll, I'll, I try to get back to everybody within 24 hours. Uh, you can also try my cell phone if I don't know who you are. Uh, I probably will let it go to voicemail because I'm I'm tired of uh, hearing about small business loans from places all over the planet. Um, but once I know someone's a customer, then I put your name in. So if you pop up again, I, I know I can take that call. Uh, or if you miss me, leave a good time to call you back. But probably a good place to start is email. And then I can, you know, when I'm awake at two in the morning or four in the morning, <laughs> it's a good time for me to take care of those those items before my day gets cranking. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there are some more questions and I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, but yes, please take up Cheryl on her um, generosity and saying you can email her. Um, thank you again, Cheryl. This was so wonderful, so inspirational. Um, loved having you with us. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We had a really full class of over 100 people, so that's pretty exciting. Um, if you are not a member or if you need to renew, we'll be sending out a survey after this class with a promo code um, to save $10 on membership. Um, if you could return that survey, we always love to hear what we could do better and what you enjoyed about the class. So thank you everybody and thank you so much, Cheryl. And everybody stay safe. And can I throw in one final comment, Laura? Yes, yes, please do. I, I, I wanna thank the... Uh... Uh, Minnesota State Horticultural Society for offering the seminar at no charge. And I want to thank the folks that are here listening. And uh, I think I had one more thing to say, but it escapes me. So with that, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Cheryl. I'll You're talk welcome. to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.